here uh, last evening, yesterday evening, and we were talking about a number of things that relates to our culture and our history. We sort of kind of wrapping things around so we can understand the honest. And uh, we touched on a lot of subjects. But this evening what I want to do, my main uh, piece that I want to do this evening, Dr. Palmer brilliant showed you the opposite. He spoke of Aten, he spoke of um, Akhenaten, Amenhotep, he spoke about the 18th dynasty, he spoke about a number of things, and he went into scripture, and he began to show you the scripture that we have been ex exposed to, is literally, as you saw, the scripture that we wrote, they saw. They being those who would wish to oppress us, and I, and, I, and, I, and I want to use those terms so that we can in a universal way, understand what it is that going forward as a people. I want to repeat what I normally always re uh, talk about, because we as a people, the greatest enemy of the human family, the greatest, plan of, uh, the, the greatest problem on the planet is the problem of ignorance. The problem we face is not the color of someone's skin, it's not their culture, it is ignorance. It just so happens that peoples of the Eurasian descent are some of the most ignorant people that are on the planet for their perception. Everyone is afraid to return back to that blackness uh, to embrace who they really and truly are. Africa has been denigrated. The African continent, the home for all human families, has been denigrated. So therefore, when folk come in and out and experience their life, the last thing they want to do is to identify with something that has been so denigrated. And those who wish to denigrate it know what they're doing when they do it. But for those who have been the, the gatekeepers of the knowledge and the wisdom, and to do that I would just go through, like you should go through a libation, and uh, you could go to those who made it possible to make this possible. And we wouldn't have made it without and it's upon their shoulders that we sit or stand. If you see me, it's because I am being hosted <coughs> by the memory of Professor John Henry Clark and Dr. Chancellor Williams. And a sister we don't call too much on, but we all should know this sister's name. Her name was Dr. Shaji Charlotte McIntyre. And if you don't know her, you need to prove her. Because there are so many people who have done so much for her. And they remain invisible to us, but they are visible to us. And I and, and I always like to thank those who have come before us because I am because they are since they are therefore I am. And it's important as a people that we understand this and we bring this in and really move forward with our faith, with our children. We have every right to have faith. To be human is to have faith. I don't trust you. Because you're ready to take me off the precipice. No, come on, man, let's go, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, no, come on, man, we'll make it. No, don't take that. Come on, be fair. No, you crazy. <laughs> now, if someone came to me with a plan on how to do it, that'd be great. Because that is someone who may have fear, but have the courage to make the job get done, but know how to do it a better way than jumping off the precipice. So it's all right to have fear, but you have no right not to have courage. And for those who have come before us and have done the things they've done and shown that sheer raw courage, we have no right to stop now. So what I'd like to do this evening is I would like to go through a process of showing us how we can put this in the curriculum. I, I just want to go directly into the curriculum. A curriculum to me is like a roadmap. A roadmap that if you lay it out properly, that you will never have to worry about because honestly, I plan on living a very long life, a long, happy, healthy life. I'm going to live a long time. I don't have no attraction, although I am ready to do what needs to be done. I, I enjoy life. So what I'm saying to you is not because I see something happening or wish something is happening, but I may not get where I see myself as a relationship of the curriculum and the schools that we need. I may not live that long it may be in 200 years that it's there. I don't know. 
But I don't care. Because if you lay out a proper road map, the ones that come behind us can pick up the road map. It's like if we were going to San Diego and we set out on the road with a, a really good road map and there were other people in the car with us. And let's just say, creator forbid, something occurred to us that we were not able to continue the journey. If the road map is good enough, those that the others that were in the car could pick up the trip and end up in San Diego. But if you don't have a good road map, you can get lost. So a curriculum is like a road map that takes you through a journey heading towards someplace that allows you to understand certain things. Here's what we need to do, from my perspective. Among many things, this is a possible potential. For our young people, we need to implement a course of study that will allow them to study the principles of science. When you talk about October, when Dr. Barber talks about Aten, he's talking about the power and the majesty of the sun. Our, our ancestors were in love with the sun because that's like a child being in love with his or her parents because we are not earthly, we are solid. This is science now. I'm not speaking high polluting magic or whatever we want to call it. I am talking about each and every one of us is bits and pieces of starlight encased in this body that is trying to get back home, like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. And so in studying the sun, you see, this Japanese brother, his name is Michu Kaku, Dr. Michu Kaku. He wrote a book called Hyperspace. He wrote a number of books, but I'm going to highlight Hyperspace. Do <laughs> you have one? Parallel universes or something like that? Did you come? Teaches uh, at CCNY. He wrote a book called Hyperspace. And in this hyperspace book, he says there are four types of civilization. Mm -hmm. And he said a civilization is only as strong as the source of its energy. A zero, one, two, three. Civilization. A zero civilization depends on the earth for its energy. Water power, air power, earth power, you know, the oil we put in our cars, the gasoline, all that comes from the earth. All living matter, by the way, all black, possible. <coughs> water power, the water wheels, the wind, you draw your energy from that. That's the zero civilization. You use all the things of the earth to move into your, your, num your number one civilization. Remember back in the day, like when we started to see things happening on another part of the planet, another part of the earth. The way in which technology works, the way in which energy works, we could not just directly send and watch the thriller in Manila with Muhammad Ali. We could not see the fight in Kinshasa between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. So what happened? We sent satellites up in space, made of things of the earth. We sent the signal from the earth to the satellite, satellite to Congo, Congo sent it back to the satellite, the satellite sent it to our homes, and we watched Muhammad Ali using the things of the earth to energize the lives that we live. We use petroleum for cars, Airplanes, everything. We use water for its energy. We use air for its energy. But we should never use them thinking that's all we're going to do for the rest of our lives. We are utilizing the earth in order to get to the number one civilization, which is solar power. Solar power. Now imagine a civilization that what well, is already happening as we speak right now, but I'm concerned about the way in which we're going it because there's someone with another mind that's doing it that doesn't know the power of the sun. So be careful, because we're going to have some serious forest fires here pretty soon if they keep doing it the way they're doing it. African people understood the power of the sun and understood how to get energy from the sun. We know that because we see the pyramid. We know that because we see the tekken. We know that because we see the temple. 
That is physical evidence that they understood solar power. And in this, they created scientific treaties in honor of the sun. This evening, I'd like to go over one of those treaties. And I'd like us to see how we can adapt this into the curriculum to teach our children about solar power and always be trying to get them to study the technology of the sun. You use the sun for solar power. And you use the sun so well that pretty soon you use the sun as a satellite and you <laughs> use the satellite to see the fight in Congo. But the reason why we use the sun is because we're trying to get to galactic energy. Mm. Now this is where every human being, check this out now, our sun is a small to mediocre star. Now what happens when you get, and you they say, they don't know this, but they say, but let's play around with it. They say that you can fit one million Earths in our sun. That's how big the sun is. Although it's a gas now, but let's just say. Now suppose I should present to you a concept, I just want you to think about this. Suppose I should present an idea to you that would tell you that I know of a sun that you would be able to fit 200 million of our suns in. Now suppose I told you that that sun had a family with 18 other suns its same size. And suppose I told you that around every one of those suns rotated 250,000 of our Earths. Think about it. If we can have a mediocre sun with eight planets, the Pluto not a planet, but I gotta come back and talk about that. Suppose you had one sun, mediocre to small in size. What happens when you get to the huge ones that have family members that are just as big as them? Because if, if eight planets can revolve around our sun, if you had one that was millions the size of our sun, why can't we have hundreds of thousands of planets revolving around that sun? I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to make us think now. That's really what I'm trying to do. I'm trying, you know, the Delphonic had a song back in the day, Didn't I Blow Your Mind this time? See, I'm going to sing that to you at the end of this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you to believe a word I say. I just want you to think. Because they told us a story that is so phenomenally untrue that the truth is unbelievable. Right. Right. <laughs> We have to get to that point, brothers and sisters. Imagine a galactic energy system where each and every one of us had our own sun. I just want you to think now. Imagine. Here we are running out here at the gasoline station, put something in our car. And even on a solar energy, we're all depending on that one sun. Imagine if each and every one of us had our own sun the way we have satellites on top of our house. We could draw from our own sun, our own planet. That's galactic power, and that's the number two type of civilization. But, as our genius young people would do, they would learn how to take that number two civilization to a three civilization, and that's when you get into cosmic energy. And what happens when each and every one of us has our own galaxy of suns to draw from. What I'm telling you is possible. Because if the zero one is possible, the three is possible. All you're doing by geometric progression is moving your thoughts to the next level. Right. It's not phenomenal. It's not out of this world. But you see, when, they, when you find out, when we find out that solar power is free, because that's what Aten was saying, that's what Akhenaten was saying. Akhenaten was saying, look, you don't have to go to the priest to preach the fall of We're going to draw from a universal power that we all are in front. Make no difference how much money you got or where you're going. We have a creator that looks upon on, on each of us every day in every way, and no matter how it is, you are a child of the Son. 
And that's what the Abhan text is saying. I'm saying we need to get about that. Forget about that. The charter school system is over. Charter schools have proven that the public school system is over. Charter schools, they did too. But they just have a little bit more lifetime to them. Because charter schools, see the last time they dealt with charters, the last time I heard the word charter, it was what the kings and queens of England were giving to the pirates to come to America. Right. So I'm afraid of the word charter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know. Like the bar charter. <laughs> 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 so, see they're trying to privatize it. And in private seats, the, the public cannot sell to the private. But the public can sidestep into state, and the state can sell it to the private. And so they're after privatization, but privatization is not working. It, 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 it cannot work because private is, is always motivated by profit. And the bottom line is, is that once it gets to a certain point, those who are teaching in more challenging schools obviously don't want to make more money. And the private organizations are not going to be willing to do that. You can see it happening all around as it relates to the prison industrial complex. Now, that's the problem with the privatization of, of, of the prison. Because in prisons that are more challenging, people want to get paid more money because their life is more on the line. Private is about profit. You ain't getting paid more money. And so, therefore, I'm not going to do my job. In fact, I might watch for a breakout just so you mess with me. I'll mess with you. I'll let that brother out. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what's going to happen as, as, as time goes on. But no matter what that may be, we can't business with that. We have got to find a way to make it possible. To make it possible. And I am recommending that we start after school programs. That's real. They already exist, and it can be done. And I am not here to tell you what we can do. I'm here to tell you I'm willing to come back and help you. I ain't here pontificating this. I ain't here for a concert. This ain't two hours. This is eternity. I have an idea how we can do this. An idea. Not the idea. There are many ideas. But I have an idea how this could happen. My life has been spent towards curriculum development and staff development. Writing the curriculum and then going into schools to demonstrate to teachers, community members, how to teach. We need to develop an understanding of how we can put these types of things together. I want to show you something that I think is very important. And because I have so many different things here, brothers and sisters, I can never really truly show you certain things that I'd like. But I'd like to show you a study. For years, I've been going into schools telling people the role that culture plays in the education of children, that it makes a difference in children's lives if they're exposed to their culture if they know who they are. I've been saying this work. And every time somebody says something to me, they always say like this when they want to drop it down like this. They say, well, where's your hard data? Where is your step? Now, yeah. this is the step. It was done in Chicago, headed by a brother by the name of Jelani Mandala. And he put together a study that showed the relationship of racial identity and self-esteem. He went into a 7th, 8th grade bridge class. He had his target audience and he had his control group. And what he, became, what he came to understand as it relates to if, if, if their life can be kicked. So that, can, uh, can, uh, can you see this? Yeah, can you keep turning this on and off? Because I'm not going to, you know, part of it is going to be presentation, part of it is going to be uh, Okay, can you all see this? Yeah. Oh, this is a study. The effects of changes in racial identity and self-esteem on changes in African-American adolescents mental health. This is a hard data study. This is saying everything I've ever said all these years and all of us who have ever been saying this. This is, this is a study that proves it. So the study is here now. So we done shut down the building. So now what they got? Core curriculum. Core standards. They say, they got it. What are we going to do now? 
core standard. The core standard is what they're going to try to do to negate this. This is why I say forget the public schools. In fact, the quicker we forget the public schools and the charter schools, the quicker we'll start our own schools. And when we start our own schools, we'll hire our own, and 85% of our educational staff is not going to be 20-year-old European-American females that are afraid of our second-grade seven-year-old boy. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> Second grade. <laughs> 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 if you are, I blame your, I, I blame your, your, your counselor for that. Why would your counselor tell you to become a teacher if you're scared of the children that you teach? <laughs> and and by, by the way, it's not that she's afraid of the children. It's the fact that the children can't stand her guts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that, like like somebody Facebooked me a picture where a little boy is sitting down with his head on the desk, and the caption says, "I don't have ADD. I'm just bored of you." <laughs> <laughs> Here's what's important about this stuff, just to, to cut around. Here's what's important about this stuff. It separates the role of cultural identity from self. -esteem. That becomes very important. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. I have a classroom of 30 students. There were two students in that classroom that were born with a sense of service. These students don't even need a teacher. All they, all they need is direction. These individuals are going to be successful in life no matter what happens. I can see it. Everything they do, they do well. Everything they do, they do in a way. And we've all had that. We know them. They're in our community. They're, they're in this room. We, we, we've had these folks that have been born with this. Culture doesn't play a part as it relates to that self esteem, so to speak. It's just something that's inside of them as it relates to them as an individual. But I have 28 other students that don't feel that way. That this society has had an impact on putting them down. It has had an impact on making them feel that they're primitive and that they have not done anything. And here I am, the white master, coming to teach you and bring you out of your darkness. I'm your sick. Twenty-eight of them believe that. What this study does is that it shows that if you introduce cultural education into the classroom, all 30 students would be successful. Yeah, that's yeah. We must get it. And we have to understand this. The difference between self-esteem. The difference between self-esteem and cultural identity is someone that says, look, if I did it, you can do it. That's not true. And that's mean spirit. I was born in a project. A wonderful place. I love my home. That we call the Amsterdam Project. <laughs> That was my home. I had friends there. We struggled and worked hard. Some of us went into taking drugs. I remember when we called the cops in my dreams. Some of us fell to that. I remember when we all used to be playing in the playground. And pretty soon, after a couple of years, while some of us continued to play, some of us were over on the benches with some guy that I didn't even trust at. And pretty soon, I saw them sleeping when they should have been running around. I saw them doing something. I said, I said, what is that? I said, I call nodding out. Mm -hmm. I said, look like sleep to me. They said, no, that's nodding out. That's what I experienced in my my community. But by the grace of God, they go, I could have been there. For any number of years. And my mother and father, wonderful human beings, despite that, many of them came from great homes too. It's just the way it went down. It's just the way it went down. Those were the 28 that needed cultural identity. But they used the people with self-esteem as barriers and shields not to have to help the other 28. Mm -hmm. They said, well, you see Johnny there? Johnny can do it. Why can't you? But Johnny was born with a whole nother neuronal connection. You can't compare the two. That's unfair. But they use it like that. And then when we become, I'm not going to use no names now, okay? So we don't need to get personal. 
Or let's say we become a Supreme Court judge. <laughs> no, I ain't saying no name. But I'm just saying we become a Supreme Court judge and we then say, well, I did it. Why can't they? Well, sir, there was something in you that you had that allowed you to be able to manipulate your life to take you where you needed to go that so many of us may not have. But we, there are other things that you could do for us that we would feel that way about ourselves that just introduced to who we were. We all are different by matter of degrees. And what this study shows is that yes, you do have self-esteem. And self-esteem does lead many times to academic excellence and emotional stability. But for some of the students who come from situations that have nothing to do with the dynamic that you say makes somebody inferior or can't, can't learn or can't study. We need to get cultural identity to them and they will do, and this study proved that when they were exposed to their culture, their self-esteem went up, their academic scores went up, and everything went pretty well. Okay. Now, I want to do a sidebar here. Because I want to be careful, because I really do think that some students who do well in this system aren't that intelligent at all. They've been able to buy and show up. Because when you do well on the test, it only means that you've done well being ignorant. <laughs> but to play the game, okay? To, to play the game, I'm there. And I'm, and I'm willing to go there. So that's one of the studies. I want to show you another study. That is the other piece. That is the role that parents play in the education of our children. The parent parental racial socialization as a moderator, I call it facilitator, of the effects of racial discrimination on educational success among African American adolescents. This study was done and showed the dramatic results when parents were part of the education process of their children. I work with parents. I, I create parent academies. And I show parents their role because, you see, we're not in Africa. When, when we walk home sometimes in the evening, we don't meet our child teacher on the street. Because by 4 o'clock, that teacher is already, well, if she left at 2, she's probably halfway home. Oh. We're coming to three, four hours away from us. For a very good reason. Because if I was in my room, I'd there too. I know that. You know, my mom used to always say, if you want to teach your enemy, you're going to think like an enemy. As long as you think like you think, you ain't never going to be successful. Right. There's only one thing I don't understand about it. Knowing them as I know them at this point in my life, if I were them, in 1865, I would have lined them all black people and shot them. Because I would know the day was coming. <laughs> if I thought like them, they made a mistake. They didn't kill us. And when they didn't kill us, they signed and suicide. Because what we're doing right now is revolutionary. A hundred years from this day, those that are yet to be born will be talking about us as we are talking about our ancestors who did the work that they did. This is revolutionary in nature. We were never supposed to get this far. We were never meant to get this far. They don't even know what to do with it. That's the problem that they're having when they have their teeth on. They don't know what to do with it. They'd rather be led by a Canadian Hispanic uh, by the name of Ted Cruz. Think about that. Mm -hmm. As much as they despise Spanish speaking people, as much as they don't want to pass immigration, they are being led by a Spanish speaking immigrant <laughs> by the name of Ted Cruz. Raphael, to be exact. Raphael. 
where instead of our children, see I'm not, see I'm trying to reach out to jewelers or people who know how to make jewelry or how to make cat form so that they can start to make these little baby unks made out of plastic, inexpensive, sankofa, archon symbols, comedic symbols, falcon, ibisbird, pyramid. So instead of in the first grade them counting all them different colored bears and balloons, they start counting arms. How many arms do you have? We need to give them sheets of paper that have pictures of Madam C.J. Walker or Ida B. Wells. How many Ida B. Wells do you see on your face? I see 20 instead of 20 balloons. 20 mice. <coughs> and then we want to know why they want to go to Disney. <laughs> because you're implanting them images in their head. If you implanted, if, if, if you had children counting arms and then opened up a book on Egyptian symbols, I guarantee you that children say, I was counting that in class the other day. Because the way your neurons work, your neurons make connections. We are born with billions of neurons in our head. Within the first five years of our lives, there are approximately one-third of them that never work again. But it's not how many neurons you have that's important, it's the connection between the neurons that are important. And that's what happens in the learning. It's called relational learning. There's no way I can teach you anything you did not walk in this room know. All I can do is facilitate the process by which our engagement reminds you that you already knew it all the time. I could never put into your head something that wasn't already there. Think about what I'm saying. What's happening right now is relationships. I'm saying things to you, and you're taking these things in through your neurons, and your neurons are connecting. They're, they're making connections. And the connections that they're making are reinforcing things that you already knew, and you're connecting it to the things that you already know. And what's happening in our school system, it's like walking in and your head is like a, a coat rack. And all the bits of information that you're learning are like coats that you're putting up on your rack. But culture are the hooks. And so if you do not know your culture, and I try to put a bit of information into your head, it's going to slide off because there's no hook to catch it because you don't have the culture to do it. And the same is true for all the things that we learn in all the subjects that we learn. This is how it happens. This is how learning occurs. It's all relational learning. It's 
just like if you had, let's say, Hillary Clinton becomes president of the United States. She's not a woman <laughs> president. She is the president. It's a title. Mesut Bikin was a title. It didn't have a gender. It just was the individual that, that led. And at this time, she could not have sat on the throne if the entire committed legacy did not ask her, please have a seat. Right. Right. Or as they say, <laughs> Papa Dali Kaka. Have a seat, please. There was no overthrow. She took her place. She was succeeded by Thutmose III. Thutmose III was succeeded by Amenhotep II. Amenhotep II by Thutmose IV. Thutmose IV was succeeded by Amenhotep III. Amenhotep III was succeeded by Amenhotep IV, who would become Akhenaten. Now, what is interesting about um, this idea, this concept, is that Amenhotep III and Queen Tai are the historical figures upon which the mythology of Solomon and Shiva was Queen Tai and Amenhotep III are the historical figures upon who Romeo and Juliet was in Shakespeare's mind. And Amenhotep III and Queen Tai are the image and the likeness of what the play called Aida was built upon. This is the love affair between Africans of the South with Africans of the North, and they marry together in order to bridge together kingdom so they could chase out. As Bob Marley say, the crazy ball. <laughs> While I'm here, let me just talk to you. This is a lesson plan. This is how I write it. You have a concept, you have an understanding. What the students will be able to do. I don't want to know what they know, I want to know what they can do. The more said, if what you learn you can't do anything with, you wasted your time learning. Everything you, you learn, you, you should be able to apply. And the purpose of you being in that classroom specifically is to be able to learn what it is that you want to apply. It ain't about taking the test and passing. It has nothing to do with that. It's all about consciousness. There are a number of lessons that I do here to bring the students through certain kinds. And see, when I come back, I'm going to bring the community through this. Because the best way to teach something is to have learned it yourself. So I take adults through this learning process so they can go back and teach the, uh, the students. Because once you know what is expected of you, you know what to expect from them. Staff development isn't about me standing up and pontificating. It, it's about you going through the process so that going through the process you then can take others through the process. Think about what this means. Think about what I'm talking about. Because as I take you through this, and the biology and the reading, check this out. I'm just going to go through the body of the lesson. Is what I re Remember a road map or recipe? Okay, if I'm trying to teach somebody how to cook rice and, rice and peas, right? And, I, and Well, a curriculum is like a recipe. That it, it, it's a standard way of writing so that anyone in this room could pick up my lesson plan once introduced to it and would be able to teach it. You wouldn't teach it the way I teach it, no more than one person's right to be things like another person's right to be, because down the road it's all about what's in your hands and how you put it together. See, because grandma chicken is always better. Because grandma is in grandma's hand, you see. And the same way in teaching. You know, when somebody's teaching something, don't expect to learn it the same way the person that originated did it, but at least you can add your flavor to it. You, you might have a musical background, and you can add a music piece into this. You, you might think of a song to sing about Akhenaten. You might be an artist that has a fantastic art activity that you can do. You add your own flavor to it. But if you have a standard base, a curriculum, a road map, you know where you're headed, that way, you know where you're headed, but on your way, some of you might want to skip, some of you may want to crawl, some of you may want to dance, some of you may want to run, but whatever it is, you're all heading in the same direction, it's just you, you doing it your way. 
And that's what staff development does. Now check this. This is a whole story about Asians and Eurasians and coming up out of Iran. And geography skills. Got to have geography skills. <coughs> Talking about how the, the stone were removed in ancient Germany. Now here we go. The Temple in Man. The event. And what? Uh, this building is a couple of, le of Los Angeles blocks long. But it is built in the direct portion of the human body. And the way we know this is because in, in, in measuring the tear on the walls, on carved on the walls, is the explanation of the different parts of the body. And we know that it faces we know that the, the, that the body faces east because the explanation of the backbone is explained on the western wall. The, the purpose of the balls of your feet are explained when you walk in, right there on the temple, explains the purpose and all the parts of your feet. Where your reproductive organs are located, not only is there evidence of men, who is <coughs> the nature of, of, of a fertility, <laughs> but also there is evidence of the, the, the female ovaries and the male testicles. And where the male testicles are and where the ovaries meet, there is a drawing, check this out, a drawing of a spermatozoa. <laughs> now that's kind of small, right? It's a high issue. Hmm. What did they have? They have some of the most powerful eyes. Uh -huh. that have had. Hey, they they no their eyes are their I'm a night guy. I operate at night. My children used to they give a shot at night time. If they would get up and I would and I would be I could see them in the dark. I see better in the dark than I do my life. I can even tell my children what color they have. They said, Daddy, how you know? I think when I see you. I, I, have my, I come from a long line of males in my family. My daddy is from Tuskegee, Alabama. He's a night my, my My grandfather, his father, worked on the railroad at night. I, I operate at night. Because of my job, I used to work during the day. And then I would wake up at quarter to four for my work day. I now go to bed at quarter to four. I operate at night. My biorhythm is night. Not everybody's like that. And it's not a matter of good or bad, better or worse. It's just a matter I operate. My biorhythm is at night. That's just how I operate. And right now, I'm in heaven. <laughs> because, I, I, because since I have graduated, some people call it retirement. But since I'm in this position, I make my own days now. And so if I say I want to go to bed at quarter to four, I go to bed at quarter before. See, the power of retirement is not that you stop working. It's just that you demand on yourself when you want to work. So I'm still doing all the things that I've always done, but I'm just doing it at my biorhythmic time. Where the pineal gland is located in the temple, it's located in what's called the Holy of Holy. Now, this, mind you, this is a couple of blocks long in a city street. So they were able to take blocks and condense it into the canon of a human being, knowing exactly where to draw that. You know in your throat you have a place that like it opens and closes, where you breathe or where you chew and swallow, and sometimes you choke and you say it went down the wrong pipe. Okay, it's a block. Okay. When you get to the part in the temple where it's epiglottis, you can only open the door one way. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You, you, you can't open it both ways both times. You either open it this way or you open it that way. And that shows you that they understood the role of the epiglottis in your throat. People look like you did.
covet temple. Right where your heart is located is where they explain the function of the heart. And so this basically is the lesson plan. These are some books to read. And this is the gift to the, uh, to the teacher. This is called the answer key. <laughs> They will have to not. I'm just going to flow through this. How's my time? That's it. Well, I just want to keep it. I'm going to go on. I'm going to go on. They will have to not. We talk about uh, the Pharaoh, the Nessus Bichy. Here, Tony Browder does an excellent comparison between Akhenaten's hymn and Psalm 104. He shows where the Bible does it. Just like what Dr. Obama was saying, he shows exactly where Psalm 104 was lifted right out of the Arten text. <coughs> the world is in darkness like the dead. Every lion cometh forth from its den. All serpents stink and darkness reigns. That's Akhenaten's hymn. Here's Psalm 104. Thou makest the darkness and it is night. Wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth, the young lions roar after their prey. All trees and plants flourish, the birds flutter in their marshes, all sheep dance upon their feet. That's not going to Psalm 104. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, wherein the birds make their nests. The high hills are a refuge for the wild goats. You know, in Spanish, there's a word that we use. And Spanish coming out of the Moorish flavor. You see, the, word, the Spanish language didn't exist until 1500. So. Pigeon Arabic. Say again? Pigeon Arabic. Yeah, Pigeon Arabic. And Arabic is also an Arabic language. There's a word that they use, or a term that they use. Like, for instance, in Spanish, when you say respect, Respecto doesn't mean respect, like I respect you. It means that when you walk in and you see an elder, you come to the elder and you say, Bendicion. In other words, before I even do anything in this house, I ask you for your benediction. I ask you for your blessing. I come before the elder with respect and I ask you for your blessing. Bendicion. Okay. Elder men are called dawn. Elder female are called donna. In Spanish, when you have lost all sense of your sense of sense, when you have no value system whatsoever and your moral compass is broken, they tell you to see their blame without change. But when they tell you can't get no lower than that. That that shame and then see it's not something that's yo, 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 man. But yeah, I, I'm shame. No, you don't you don't want them to tell you you have no shame. Because that means that your name shall never be called again in the community because you no longer exist as a human factor in our experience. They have no shame. And they'll steal anything from you. And don't wait for no time. And don't wait to get it back. If you want, take it back. They ain't get it. They don't even know what to do with them again. I just never get it. And so these are phrases and concepts and ideas <coughs> as 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 related. You see the onks. Uh, when, 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 whenever you see a left hand, it, it means that it is receiving, and whenever you see the right hand, it means that it is giving. And so here on this side, when you see the thumb, that it looks like this. Okay, you're you're looking the sun. This image that you have there is like this. It means that it is receiving and it is giving. But if that is true, what is the sun telling you with your time? The serpent in the middle. What is it saying to you? It says that just as the sun gives you life, because the angst, you see the angst by the nose? Just as the sun gives you life, so too do you venerate and vibrate life back to the sun. Okay. <laughs> Give and take. Because you are the sun of the sun. 
brought Moses, son of the son. Powerful. <coughs> a picture speaks a thousand words. A symbol speaks a thousand words. That goes back to what you were saying earlier about uh, the sun having its own galaxy or uh, you were doing like a comparison of what you were talking about earlier. Yes. So basically, we're giving back energy to the sun. Yes. Yes. Well, you see, the energy we're giving back to the sun is the energy that the sun gave up. The, 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 the love that we give to our children is the love that we're going to get back from our children. It's, it's, it, and, and it's the same love, and sometimes from the children, it's a greater love. And so the sun is the same thing. We are children of the sun. The lightning energy that emanates from us is the lightning energy the sun gave us. But in our manufacture of our lives, in the world that we live in, the things that we do, we take that light of the energy and manifest it to a higher level and return it back to the sun so that the sun will have a better life just as a child would give back the love to the parent in order for the parent to have a better life than the parent had when it was first born. And Akhenaten understood this. Our ancestors understood this. Akhenaten didn't invent anything new. We know that his mother, Queen Tai, had a temple to Aten in a place called Atiye in Nubia. We know that Amenhotep III had a temple to Aten in a place called Sedenga. We know that. We know that our ancestors were paying homage and respect to the light and the energy of the sun from the very beginning of days when we call them Atum. Atum and Aten is the same essence. Akhenaten didn't invent anything new. He just made Akhenaten the official religion or the, the official philosophy of the Kemetic Kingdom. But that's not new. And here they all get giving honor to the sun. I want to show you. This is an illustration of what the great hymn to the Aten looks like. I want you to see to the primary source. I do not want to, to just speak about it. I want you to see it. This is what the Medunetta looks like. That's all the Aten text. This is an illustration to be able to see it because <coughs> When you look at it, it's on the western wall of Pharaoh I tomb. And that's what it looks like. Unless you're up on it, it's very difficult for you to see it. So I put the illustration so that you can see what the actual Medunetta symbols and siphons look like. So that when you look at this, that other piece I showed you before is an illustration of what you're looking at right now. Because I want you to understand that this document exists. This is the temple wall of Pharaoh I who succeeded Akhenaten. This document exists. I want to go to the lesson plan. You know, when I first went to Kemet and I returned I was just so excited. I was just so taken back. I was a kindergarten teacher at the time. And I brought my slide presentation. And I was just so excited about teaching my students about this great uh, this great land. <coughs> and I was just all up in it. I was excited. I was teaching them that. I was showing them slides. As I was wrapping up the class, one of the students raised his hand and said, Brother Booker T, the next time we have a class trip, can we go to ancient Egypt? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I learned something. And that is, whenever you're teaching something, always ground people in time and space before you take them where you want them to go. Time is history, geography is space. 
Whenever I do my lessons, I always start with geography. To place them in space so they know where they are. And then I tell them about history. To put them in the chronological order of events. When I was so excited about what, ha what I had in Egypt, they perceived, because I made it so real for them, and because they saw the slides, they thought that ancient Egypt could be gone to. They didn't realize that ancient was long ago and Egypt is far away. <coughs> I hadn't grounded them in space and time. And so therefore they saw the possibilities of them having this experience on the next trip. Yeah. And so I learned that when you teach, particularly the children, you have to ground them in space and time. And so I always begin my lesson in geography and history. Photovoltaics. Photo light. Uh, voltaics means electricity. Here's the geography. Taking them through the, the, the now uh, valley. Taking them here. <coughs> Showing them where Akhenaten <coughs> is located, or what's called El Amarna. Showing them where it's located. Okay? Identifying it so they know where I'm talking about. I fill them with maps from all different perspectives. I give them examples and definitions of cosmogony, cosmogenous, cosmology, cosmologist, cosmos, cosmo uh, cosmography. Cosmic ray, cosmographic. And then I teach them about stars and Milky Way. How Ra gets his her energy. The effusion of hydrogen atoms. This is where I introduce the periodic table of elements in chemistry. Little by little, don't have to teach them the whole table, just teach them what they need to know. Hydrogen and helium, that's all you need to know. And how light and heat energy and what an atom looks like. Basic, not heavy. Because what I'm doing is I'm building on their knowledge base. We try to throw as much as we can to the children. They are very intelligent. But I believe that if you build on their knowledge and wisdom, that's how you do it. And, and, and you superimpose more knowledge, over more knowledge, over more knowledge. And, and, and pretty soon they have a great understanding. Then I talk about the color of the star, the temperature in degrees Celsius. I compare the life of a star to the life of a human. And of course, the answer upside down in the teacher world. I ain't gonna give you the answer. You'll have to turn it upside down. Yeah. I talk about the wave theory. See, this is all before I teach you what I'm about the object. I'm, I'm heading somewhere here. But it's like, if you're going to San Diego, yes, sir. It's, 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 uh, he has to change the state or something. Yeah. Are any questions about it? Do you think uh, to uh, bring this uh, to our children here, there is a river here, yes. and there is a pyramid here oh, in yeah. Grand Canyon oh, yeah. that we should demand that it be open to us <coughs> so that we may see what is there. Yes, absolutely. At the, uh, the movie. Uh, Pyramids across this entire 
this entire planet. Come on, check this out. Of course you know that you have pyramids in Peru. Okay, you have pyramids in Peru. You have pyramids in Chile. You have pyramids in Brazil. You have in Argentina. You have in Costa Rica. You have in Mexico. You have in Canada. You, well, let me tell you this. Did you see all of these pieces here? All of these here? All of these are by alphabetical order. From Arkansas to Wisconsin, you have pyramids all over the place in America. Africans were all over here. Okay? Can I tell you something? You know, that's my lesson plan. I teach a college course, Africans in Ancient America. When I taught this class, the chairperson of the American History course, said he better never teach that class again. Because what those two see, what they did was that what's called cross-listing. <laughs> when they cross-listed my class, there were students in American history, there were students in ancient American history, there were, there, there were students, see I'm, I'm black studies, I teach black studies, but because this course was listed Africans in ancient America, it was cross-listed for all of the different students that had anything to do with American history. All right. But what they didn't know was what I was going to teach. And when them students of all different cultural backgrounds came out of that class, <laughs> they had questions for their professors that their professors could not answer. And they said, well, we lost about 80 of them. Because that's how he was in my class. But we ain't going to lose no more. So they forbid me from teaching the class anymore. Wow. I'm ready, brother. No, I'm worried, brother. Oh, 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 oh you say you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you said don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. I taught a course. Oh, thank you. I'm okay. I taught a course, Africans in Medieval Europe, okay, I guess the people in the Medieval Europe department didn't get the message from the American History Department, so they come up with this one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Man, oh man. I teach in the state of Alabama. I'm in the Black Studies Department. Here's the book, The Golden Age of the Law. African presence in early Europe. And they said, now. Well, the, the thing is, is that there's, there's an essay in here that critiques that book. So I use the critique as opposed to the book itself. Okay, come on, don't stop there now. I, I taught a class in Quebec. Shocked the classics department said, well, you better never teach that class again. Look, look, see, here's what I want you all to understand. The, the, the bottom line is, is that it's not me, it's the information. And amongst students of all different cultural backgrounds, when you get them young, they're hungry for the information and the great majority of them do not mind being African. They, they have no problem. It's only when they get older that they start to have problems because they have invested their life system in inferiority. 
When you're young, you're searching for whatever and you're willing to grasp from any angle of your life. But when you get older, you have invested everything who you are into something that is a false illusion. And when you come upon someone like me and I show you this, they love it. They say, wow, I didn't know this. Well, why are we having problems learning this? I don't see nothing wrong with this. I have blonde hair, a blue-eyed uh, student come on my class and say, yeah, I'm an African. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, just one more that I just want to show you, uh, just so you can get a sense. See, these are all college classes, and there's just one more that I want to show you that I saw. I teach a course on African cosmology, where we look at the Shabaka Stone, the Dogon text, and the Congolese cosmology written by Dr. Fu. But uh, with that, how's my time, brother? Mm -hmm. how, 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 how's my time? How much more time? Because I know somebody said they want to take a short break after a while. Yo, 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 feel breakish? Yeah. And they call it breakish. They can't walk. Please, if they can let me know what they feel like, like who want to stretch out. Here is the part two of the lesson plan. <laughs> Ultraviolet light. Yeah, for who hungry, bro, we could take a um, food break if you want to. You know what I mean? Sure, man, let's do ten minutes. Okay. Once, if, if, if I can go through this, let's, let's take a break, and then I'm going to come back, and we're going to decipher the Aten text. Okay. See, we talk about waves when we compare it to uh, snakes. The, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the troughs and the crests of waves, sine waves, mm -hmm. electromagnetic spectrum, electromag uh, uh, electrical currents and magnetic fields. We talk about the comedic comparison between today's symbols and waves and the comedic waves that's the Uraeus. We come down into the Aten text and we talk about the colors of the rainbow and how you can see the different levels. From radio raw to TV raw to heat raw to infrared raw to visible raw are the low frequencies. As you can see by the wide, okay? And then you get into the, the, the X-ray, the gamma ray, and the cosmic ray. All of these rays. That's why I tell black folks, don't ever be in a room of mixed cultures and ask people, did you hear? Because in your ear, in your inner ear, <coughs> you have little hairs mm -hmm. that vibrate in melanin. You hear things other people don't. In your eyes, you have melanin. You see things other people don't see. So that's why you say, did you see that? They're crazy. They're telling you that you're crazy. See, because the model is, if they can't hear it, whatever you hear, you must be crazy. So in your senses, you have melanin built up in your skin. Grandmama come by you and go through you. What? I ain't real nothing. You crazy? Something comes through. You have a taste in your mouth. You say that that don't taste right. Something's wrong. Right. Well, what do you mean? What you eat? You ain't got nothing in your mouth. You have three ears. You have a first, second, and third eye. You have three nostrils. You have a first, second, third nostril. You have three ears. Your first year, your second year, and your third. You know what Grandma said? Did you hear what I said? She's not talking about this year. Right. She's talking about that third year. Right. <laughs> you have two skins. When something happens and them hairs stand up, something comes through you and there's a flush that goes through your body. See, like that? In Spanish, they're better, 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 better. Because they believe that you are possessed. And you are. 
with the African holy So the next time you go like that, try to figure out why it came your way. Because either something that happened before you or something that's about to happen, that was a symbol and a sign to tell you it either came or it's coming. Mm. Mm. African folk knew how to interpret people. But you see, we've lost because we've bought into their illusion. Mm. Here's another way. This comes from Jewel Kuku. <coughs> See, you're going to hear me tell about a lot of scholars because this work ain't mine. I, I'm telling you right now, this work, I did not generate this work, but I bring all the work of the great master scholars together in order to synthesize it exactly so that you can see it. Yeah. This is Jewel Cooper, who created a chart in her book, Vitamins from A to Z, who is showing you what different what I just told you. See, here's a black folk see. They see the whole spectrum. Asian, see that much. From microwave to x-ray. See white hole? Ah, oh, they see color Wow. Wow, let's see. Say again? Yes. Yes. And it, 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 it is because of the nature of their experience and their environment in the ice age that while it's a, 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 a healthy pioneer gland, yeah. Looks like a brick. Thick. That that would be more of like the uh, the uh, Eurasian that has a bit of of, of the upper northern Eurasian. Um, it would be like an Aryan who has some black. It would be like an Arab that has some black. Well, albino is a whole other situation. But that individual who is who, who has got some black in them, brown, they they can see pretty good too, but they see from radio to X. But my point I'm trying to make is black folk see <coughs> all. It's very difficult for them to see. The light. Yes, but you see, even your sometimes even Europeans in the color of their eyes, even if it's blue, it's better than pink. You, you see, because the, the, you know, like when you turn off all the lights, your 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 iris will open up, will open up, it will dilate. See, see that's why I'm a night eye. That's why I can see in the dark because I, I I'm at my best when my eye is fully dilated. But when someone turns the light on, you've got to close your eyes and wait for your eye to dilate down to one quarter of the size. And that's why you have a small. You ever see cats? Yeah. Cats' eyes are full at night, but they're slanted like this during the day. Because they've got to close. Because they have huge eyes, that's why they see the way they see. Because cats can see. Birds are nothing. So when you are albinoid, uh, something within your system has denied your, your body to be able to produce the type of melanin needed within the body. That has nothing to do basically with people of European descent, because there are albinos in Congo. Yeah, exactly. There are albinos all over, there are Chinese albinos. Everywhere. Albino is a biological situation that creates uh, the synthesis of light heat energy in order to make the, you know, the, you know, the type of melanin needed to, to an active life goal. We're ready to wrap this up. Wrap up. <laughs> Here I then describe what rock, what rock, raw light is, invisible light, cosmic ray, gamma ray, x-ray, ultraviolet, and then the waves beyond the ray, radio heat waves. And then I go into the pyramid text. And I show you where in our ancestors' writing you can see them talking about the eye of Heru and where it's located. Utterance 523, a May the sky make the sunlight strong for you. May you rise up to the sky as the eye of Ra. May you stand at the left eye of the moon, where the speech of the excellence is concerned. Stand up at the head of the spirit that ever stood at the head of the living. This is coming from Richard King's book, African Origins of Bio uh, Biological Psychology. Utterance 639. See, because again, I want you to be able to be equipped after we finish our lesson. 
I want you to be able to be equipped to walk and be able to have enough confidence in your ability to be able to quote these things, primary sources, so that when folk come at you and they talk to you, you you can show them where you are, where your sources of information are, and you're not just pontificating off the top of your head about something. We're talking science here. I am not talking anything other than science. I don't have time for talking and not being able to show you where I get this information from. It becomes very important to me. It's detrimental and it's mean-spirited for me to come before the community and speak what I speak. And in a sense, you walk out of here feeling good, but you're puffed up. It's like tapioca. <laughs> you give tapioca to a baby because the baby's hungry. They don't have no nutritional value at all. <laughs> they just shut that baby up. <laughs> this ain't no tapioca here. This is nutrition. <laughs> The book is called African Origins of Biological Psychiatry. Here's the coffin text. Because I'm not just going to do the pyramid text, I want to go to the coffin text. Now I'm walking towards teaching the the, the Aten text, which we're going to do when we come back from the break. But, but I want to show you that I'm just not coming at you. Here I did a uh, my I, I did two two theses two master theses on a man by the name of William Leo Hansberry. William Leo Hansberry was the first man of African descent or any descent to establish an African studies program in the Frederick College in the United States. He developed it at Howard University in 1923, and he taught three classes on African history. He is the uncle to Lorraine Hansberry. Lorraine Hansberry's father was Carl Hansberry, and Carl Hansberry was William Leo Hansberry's brother from Gloucester, Mississippi. And when I did my first master's in history, my thesis, guided by Dr. John Henry Clark, was dealing with the life of William Leo Hansberry and his works. And one of the works that I, that I studied, I went to his home in Washington, D.C. His daughter, Galen K. Hansberry, allowed me to go down into his files and examine his work. And one of the essays that I brought out that I studied was an essay that he called African Worship of the Sun, which establishes for us an understanding as to why Africans would view the sun as they did. And it takes you through the age of superstition to the age of religion to the age of science to the age of soul science. And so I, I, in this essay, he literally takes you through the process of understanding that in the beginning it was a, a superstition of the sun. It was just an early human family of Africa looking up at the sun and looking at this magnificent celestial body. But, but knowing that it was important, but not knowing why it was important. And so it created rituals and ceremonies that had no grounding as it would relate to understanding exactly what it was. But after a while, they began to realize that it was so very special that it must be a god. And so therefore it became a god. And then as they studied it even further, they realized that it wasn't a god, that it was in fact a scientific reality, that light and heat energy came from this essence that gave them light. And then they got to the point when they knew the science and the religion, they then said, well, wait a minute, this is a soul science. The sun is not just a scientific entity, it's a spiritual entity, and in fact that spiritual entity is me. And then they came to the conclusion that each and every one of us is God having a human experience. Along with this essay examined, this essay examined William Leo Hansberry's study of the sun as it relates to why Africans would hold it in such high regard. And as we uh, come out, out of this and get ready to go on the break, as we move out of this, we come to understand that it is at this point, with this amount of knowledge that we've gone through so far, more intense now, but I'm talking about like a weekend. <laughs> After you're leaving here, now you're ready to understand why Akhenaten would have written the Aten text the way he did, and why he would have taken the work of his ancestors and bring the work of the ancestors up to the next level in order for them to be able to do what they did. Now, we're going to take a break for hold
for those of you who were here last night, this is all right. What's your name?
Had I not decided to do the class the way I did it, that might never have been able to become a business money. But because I wanted them to learn it, the ancestors, Hapi, said, I'm going to let this be a business for you. And it's also because these people out here are ripping you off. They're ripping you off bad because I don't want much it costs to make this off. And the price I asked for, $10 a buck, which is bigger than the sample I gave you, Ten dollars a bottle. I make a respectable. I make a living, not a killer. <coughs> on ten dollars. If my bottle is ten dollars and I make a living and not a killing, can you imagine what people out here are spending one hundred fifteen, two hundred dollars for that little mm -hmm. bottle mm -hmm. that are making on you as it relates to the profit level? I don't package it real beautiful because one thing I know is most people would just tear it out of the package and throw the package away. But you pay for a lot of the packaging. That's really what you're paying for. You, you take it out the box and throw it away, but the box is what you could take it out the box, carry the box and throw the perfume away. So you pay more for the box than you are the perfume. Wow. But I tell this story also to, to explain to you that in your head, you have an olf olfactory bulb. You have a long-term memory system that's coming out of your hippocampus. You see me. You are creating visual memories. Everything you do, everybody you look at, you're creating visual memories. You hear me. You are creating audio memories. You might hear somebody say something in another part of the world years from now. And you will be brought back into this room with the experience that you had in this room this evening, this day. You see me, and you hear me. Can you take a smell of that? Now you smell. <laughs> Let's take a break. Hold down.